All right, we're going to take a break from the Sermon on the Mount because it is the first Sunday of Lent. And so wanted to see if we can establish uh, the, the, first, the first Sunday of Lent, get, get Lent kind of established. For those of you who um, don't know about liturgical churches, if you weren't raised in one, there's an annual calendar. And so we have just entered Lent uh, as of last Wednesday, Ash Wednesday. And so we are either out of ordinary time, some churches end Christmas season and Epiphany uh, at different places. So, and some churches, Epiphany Tide goes all the way to the day before Ash Wednesday, Shrove Tuesday. Other churches, it ends right after the Feast of Jesus' presentation and baptism. And, uh, and so then it goes back into ordinary time. And we're going to be in Easter Tide until Easter, and then we'll be in Pentecost mode all the way till Pentecost, and then we go back into ordinary time until Advent uh, before Christmas. So that's kind of the way the liturgical calendar works, and you probably didn't care about that at all. But, you know, for me, I love this stuff, you know, and I love it because it gives a shape to the year. It gives a shape to our, our journey on a, on a cyclical annual basis. And I think it's important for us to have those kind of milestones. We've, we've sort of blown through all of those in our culture. We don't have rites of passage anymore. We don't have these types of, of feasts and, and milestones along the way that give us a shape to the journey and let us know where we are and how we're doing, you know, where we are, that sort of thing. So I think it's important. But anyway, let's usher in Lent today, and let's see if we can take a look at it. For most of us who did grow up in the Catholic Church, or maybe the Episcopal Church, at least I know for, for me, Lent was a time of deprivation. Lent was a negative time. It was a time when we had to give up something that we loved in order to repent for our sins and do penance for our sins. What we're trying to do is reimagine Lent, not as a negative, but as a positive. This is our chance now to clear out a space so that we can bring in new presence, we can bring in new awareness, we can actually prepare ourselves for the new life that is Easter. And so that clearing out, of course, yes, that is going to be taking some things out that are distracting, right? But not negatively as a punishment, but positively as a way of being able to now bring in something new. You can't fill a full vessel, you gotta empty it out first. So if you want something new, then some of the other stuff has to go so we can bring in new. This is what Lent is all about. A friend sent me an article, and um, he, he sent it to me because his whole life he feels that his circuit breaker is like at the wrong level of sensitivity. <laughs> he says, something's always tripping my circuit breaker. You know, It's like I've got a one-amp fuse, and I keep getting 10 amps coming in, and it's just flips my circuit breaker all the time. And he's, he was trying to, he's been trying to figure out what is it that makes him so sensitive, so triggerable. I loved his circuit breaker analogy. He sent me this because he said, I think this may explain some things. Uh, the title is, Depression and Anxiety Symptoms Are Linked to Information-Seeking Behavior. What does that mean? Let's see if we can just get a couple of paragraphs to, to kind of see where they're coming from. A new study published in Frontiers in Psychiatry indicates that information-seeking behavior is related to symptoms of emotional disorders. The research found that greater depression and anxiety symptoms are associated, associated with both a reduced tendency to gather more information in situations of uncertainty and a reduced tendency to accept current knowledge on how to seek solutions. So you see where they're going with this? You're not looking for answers, and you're not accepting the answers that are out there. And this is linked to emotional disorders in the people that they study. For example, some people continue to feel very uncertain about what to do, even after many experiences in a given situation. These people continue to seek out information to decrease uncertainty and may take too long to settle on a successful pattern of behavior. In contrast, other people jump to conclusions about the best thing to do after very few experiences. In other words, they don't seek out enough information. This can prevent learning the best course of action to achieve their goals. Right now, one of the studiers said, we don't know if either of these problems might contribute to depression or anxiety. If we figure this out, we might be able to help them better balance their level of information seeking. 
But here was the line that stood out to me. These findings are in line with previous research that has found depression and anxiety are linked to an intolerance of uncertainty. Put that one on your fridge, please. Emotional disorders are linked to an intolerance of uncertainty. Now, however that plays out in your life, whether you're seeking more information or seeking less, right? If you have an intolerance of uncertainty, you're going to be living in a world of hurt. I think that's it. They could have left all the rest somewhere else, but that one line really says it all. It's powerful. The source of all emotional disorders is an intolerance of uncertainty because intolerance of uncertainty is a source of all our fears. And our fears are the source of all our emotional disorders. If we are so intolerant of, of uncertainty, if we are so terrified of uncertainty, if not knowing what is coming next, not having control over everything in our milieu, if you will, our situation, our circumstances, then we are going to have to deal with that on some other level. That fear is not just going to sit there and play nice. It's going to come out in some way, and it does in emotional disorders. And yet at the same time, and here's the big catch, uncertainty is the engine of spiritual health. Uncertainty is the engine of psychological health. It has to be this way. If you are avoiding or denying uncertainty, and you are trying to live as if you know it all, as if you have all the answers, as if everything is OK, that kind of lack of awareness is what is going to be creating the disorders for you. Jesus is all over this stuff. Jesus teaches like a Zen master. It's so important to understand, we have so anglicized Jesus. We have so westernized Jesus. We don't realize that the way Jesus taught was much more akin to a far eastern Zen Buddhist master or a Taoist than to any modern western Christian pastor. Jesus works in uncertainty. He trades in uncertainty. He is trying to engender uncertainty in us because that is the engine of our growth. If we can't tolerate uncertainty, then we can't tolerate life. Life is uncertain. Do you need any more proof? Life is uncertain. Life is not under our control. And if we can't handle that, if we can't accept that, if we can't find workarounds and ways to thrive within the uncertainty between the horns of a paradox, then we're lost. We are going to have to descend into disorder because there's no way that we can handle life on life's terms if we haven't come to terms with uncertainty as non-rational paradox as the basis of human life. It's just the way it is. Jesus uses this. If you analyze his teaching, he's using uncertainty. He's using paradox to create what the Buddhists have called the great doubt. I don't know if you've heard this term before, the great doubt. It is a concept of Zen Buddhism. They envision it as the point of no return. They envision it as moving right up to the edge of the precipice where one more step is going to put you into the unknown. One more step is going to put you in free fall. One more step is going to require complete surrender to the process. I always think of Indiana Jones, right? Taking the leap of faith in that thing, and he's just got to step down on what looks like thin air. That's the point of no... Zen masters use this. They try to get their students right up to the precipice. They try to gauge where they are in terms of this great doubt. And there are stories where they can walk up to one of their students meditating if they think that they're right there, right at the precipice, and just clap behind their heads, and it'll break them into awakening. And the idea is the greater the doubt, the greater the awakening the greater your ability to accept and move into uncertainty, the greater will be the awakening, not the opposite. Only from this precipice of great doubt can we learn something completely new. And that should be obvious. 
If we are clinging on to what we think we know, then all we are going to do is always see reality through that filter. Whatever gets through the little holes of our filter of what we think we know about reality is all we're ever going to see. So reality is always going to look familiar to us. It's always going to look like what we think we already know. And so something as big as the good news of gospel, something as radically different as unconditional love, how is that ever going to get through the little holes of our filter. I guess I should be using a mask analogy for these times, right? How is it ever going to get through? It can't do it. So being able to empty out, going to the precipice, you know, that is the idea here. Jesus, when he is talking to the people that are coming to him for teaching, for advice, for directions along the way, what is he telling them? He's telling them, you got to sell everything, sell it all, and then come follow me. If you put your hand to the plow and you're looking over back at what you already think you know, then you're not fit to go where I'm going. Unless you're willing to hate your father and mother and your sister and your brother and your children and even your own life, you can't go where I'm going. If you're not willing to pick up your cross daily, deny yourself and follow me, you're still loved. You, know? you can carve out whatever kind of life that you can carve out, but you will never be as free as you could be. You'll never experience the complete freedom of fearless vulnerability and the connection that comes from that. Everything that Jesus is doing is trying to get people to keep shedding what is comfortable, what they already know, what is familiar. And the goal is to get back to that childlike state. Why does he keep holding up a child as the emblem of kingdom? Because the child doesn't have these preconceptions yet. The child doesn't know anything yet. The child is precognitive and is able to accept reality and the moment exactly as it is. That's why a child still lives in a magical state. Because they're just there, accepting what it is at every moment. And of course, the adult equivalent of the child is the talia, is the domestic servant who chooses to serve. Or even better, the Amavim, the one who has come to rely only on God because under their own power, they're on the margins. They are not able to take care of themselves in their society because of their station of birth or whatever. But they finally get to the point where they rely on God. This is what Buddhists call beginner's mind. To come right back to the beginning where you realize you don't know anything about this thing you are beginning to study. And you accept everything as brand new. To voluntarily come back to that place and let go of the things you know and come back to beginner's mind. Open, eager, no preconceptions, and no judgments. Why is Jesus so hard on judging? Because judgments use the preconceptions set in stone, keeping everything at arm's length. Now, there's always a catch, right? Because between us and this grateful humility of the child or of the anavim that we're trying to get to lies that great doubt. That great doubt is terrifying to us. It's like a wilderness that deconstructs everything. If we go out into this wilderness, everything is called into question, right? That is terrifying to us. But we need to go there. We need to go to ground zero if we want to go where Jesus is going. And where Jesus is going requires this type of ruthless sacrifice, denying of self in order to get there. That's why all the imagery is there. The imagery of the cross is there. It's not just a story that happened. It is a story that keeps happening, that is happening to us right now if we're not willing to go through, not the physical crucifixion, but the laying down of self, the laying down of, of what is our security blanket on a daily basis, then we can never go there. But we're terrified of the wilderness, of the doubt, of the uncertainty, and we would do anything to avoid it, including being emotionally disordered. And you would think that that's not a choice, but often it is. How many people do you know? How often did you not avail yourself of the tools and the help that you were offered? Because it was too scary to go someplace. The devil we know is much preferable to the devil we don't. And that's the way emotionally so much of this works. And what's more, we've all been taught by the church that doubt is bad. 
Doubt is a sin. Doubt is the opposite of faith. That's what we've been taught. But at the same time, I'm saying that Jesus is creating the doubt. Maybe not creating the doubt, but he's taking us to a place of doubt. So what gives here? We've been taught that doubting Thomas, right? Remember doubting Thomas, the one who wouldn't believe that the others of his followers saw the risen Christ? He said, until I can stick my finger in the holes and into his side, I'm not going to believe. We've been taught that he was weak. We've been taught that he was a sinner. We've been taught that he was faithless. But Thomas, if we're going to make this turn where Jesus is trying to take us, we need to realize that Thomas is our hero. He's not a sinner in that sense. He's our hero. All of Jesus' followers doubted the resurrection, every single one of them. Even the first ladies, Mary, who was there first at the tomb, she couldn't believe that Jesus was risen. She was there to simply anoint the body. And even when Jesus appeared to her, she didn't recognize him because it couldn't be him. That didn't comport with what she thought she knew about life and death and the way the world works. And every one of the disciples didn't believe her. They had to have their own personal experience before they were able to have their minds so completely blown, blown out, that something new could come in that just shattered their worldview. It had to happen that way. They all doubted. They all had to have their personal experience and Thomas is showing us the way past that great doubt. He's showing us the way through. Why? Because he asked for a personal experience, didn't he? Until I put my fingers in the holes, until he's right in front of me. I need a personal experience. At the same time, he was not paralyzed by his doubt. He kept moving forward. He was actually one of the most courageous disciples he was the one who was always asking the tough questions. He was always the one that was moving through. He acted in the presence of doubt, which is the definition of faith. The opposite of faith is not doubt. The opposite of faith is certainty. As soon as you think you're certain, <coughs> all faith has stopped. Faith has left the building. It's acting in the presence of doubt and uncertainty. That is faith just as acting in the presence of fear is courage. And acting in the presence of uncertainty and doubt brings the personal experience. That's why at the precipice where you're all emptied out and the next step takes you into the unknown, that's the one. Like the second mile that Jesus talks about, going the second mile, that's what takes you into the unknown. That's what takes you into the presence of something that you've never experienced before. And every follower of Jesus had to have a personal experience. Thomas needed a personal experience. He asked for it. He got it. And you know what? We all need a personal experience too. Something as big as gospel, something as big as God's love can't be transferred to us. It's not a mental exercise. You can't just read it in a book and say you believe it. Well, you can, but mental assent is not the same thing as a conviction that goes as deep as a personal experience that is actually life-changing, that will actually withstand the storms that are going to buffet you in life. That's the difference. That's what we're trying to talk about. So this is the first Sunday of Lent. It's 40-day period in preparation for Easter. And I know you're going to look on the calendar and say, okay, it's 46 days, Dave. Yeah, well, the church doesn't count Sundays, so it's still 40 days, all right? And since we're here on the first Sunday of Lent, we've got about 40 days left. So you haven't missed it, you know, in terms of if you want to try to put a program in place for yourself to use Lent in the way that it was intended to be Lent used. This 40-day period of Lent is mirroring Jesus' 40 days in the wilderness. Now, why do we need to prepare for Easter? We already know what Easter's all about, don't we? I mean, if I asked every single one of you, you would be able to tell me what Easter is, and you think you know, and you understand what it is. But what would Jesus say if you brought him your definition and your concept of Easter? He'd tell you to sell it all. <laughs> He'd tell you to sell it all. Follow me and see something you've never seen before. Sell follow, see. That's the formula. That's the prescription Jesus is always giving us. Get rid of everything. 
follow me down this path and see what you see. See what happens. See what occurs to you. The Easter that we have in our minds is not the Easter that Thomas experienced. How could it be, right? Can we experience what Thomas did? Well, no, we can't experience physically the risen Lord. Of course not. But Jesus then tells us that we are even more blessed if we can experience what we haven't seen, right? If we can believe, if we can trust what we haven't seen. So God is still an equal opportunity employer here. It's still okay. Even though we don't have access to Jesus in physical form, we can still do exactly what we need to do and exactly what they did as well. There's an Easter experience that only each one of you will ever know. It's between you and God alone. It is your experience, and it will be unique. It won't be like anyone else's because it is between you and God. If you actually prepare, if you actually come prepared to see what you've never seen before, and all that's standing between you and that experience, of course, is the great doubt. <laughs> but remember, the greater the doubt, the greater the awakening. So the 40 days of Lent is intended to be used as a time of engendering this great doubt, a time of emptying yourself out and bringing yourself to the precipice. But it only works if you make it so. It has to be something intentional that you actually do. It's just not going to happen on its own. Lent is the church's symbolic and ritual enactment of what each of us must do in order to be able to see and experience this new life, to be able to let go of your safety nets, your personal safety nets, your personal standards of judgment that you use to judge every moment and every person and everything that you encounter in life and descend into this place of great doubt, descend into the place of uncertainty where you admit, I don't really know anything anymore but I trust that God is going to show me to empty yourself into that beginner's mind, accept the personal experience of that doubt that is going to blow away your expectations and your beliefs if you will let it. Lent is meant to be this ritualized reenactment of Jesus' 40 days in the wilderness, which was his time of great doubt his time of pushing himself to the precipice of emptying everything that he thought he knew. And how is that described for us in the gospel? He was pushed to starvation. He was pushed to the point of exhaustion. This was not a kind and gentle way of going out into the night. This was something that he put himself in the place of. It was really difficult to do, right, to go right to the edge. But Every person of faith in the Old or New Testament, in all of Scripture, did exactly the same thing. And there's a record of that. It's amazing how consistent it is. You just name a great figure in Scripture, and there will be that shape to their journey, where they descended and then they reascended on the other side. Whether it's Paul, whether it's all of Jesus' followers, whether it's Abram, who became Abraham, Moses, Noah, Elijah, all of them have the same shape to their journey. And it's usually connected with a 40-ness, right? 40-something, 40, 40 days and nights, 40 years, 40-something. 40 because after a peak experience, maybe an epiphany, a revelation, a conversion moment, you know, a calling of some sort, if there's not a period of emptying and consolidation of everything that has been experienced, it doesn't last. It blows right through us and out the other side. And it takes a long time to bring that spectacular mountaintop experience down into all your moments, down into your cells and your DNA, where it becomes what informs your choices. It becomes what informs your attitude and the way that you look at life. We have to let this stuff filter down and permeate every breath we take to quiet it down into everyday wisdom that we can use on a daily basis that changes the way that we interact with each other. Have you ever been with a brand new believer? It could be anything, you know. It could be multi-level marketing. It could be religion. It could be politics, anything. But have you ever been with a really new believer? Don't they absolutely wear you out with all their superlatives and their energy and their excitement and everything is just the greatest thing that we ever heard, you know? 
That's part of it. That's the honeymoon period. That's, yeah, we, we need that, uh, obviously. And that new believer is always looking for the next spectacular thing, the next peak experience, the next superlative. But after a while, if they really take the journey, that starts to even out. Take a look at Paul's life, for, for example. Paul has this incredible experience on the road to Damascus, right? He actually sees the risen Lord. But what happens immediately after? There's something like scales on his eyes, and he's blinded, and he can't even see. And it's only after he is carried to Damascus, and Ananias helps him get rid of the scales so that he can see again. What's the first thing he does? He goes into Arabia, and we don't exactly know where that is, but it's not Judea. It's not Galilee. He goes off into the wilderness for up to 14 years. If you count the time between that Damascus experience and his first missionary journey, it's 14 years. Consolidating, understanding, pushing himself to the precipice. What did that mean? It doesn't happen overnight. He was willing to go through that process. And then when he gets out the other side and he starts his journey, is the stone all smooth in Paul? <laughs> Not even a little bit. He's fighting with everybody. First thing he does is pick a fight with the rulers in Jerusalem. You know, he's picking a fight with the Galatians. He's fighting with everybody. He's screaming at the top of his lungs, the things that I want to do, the things that I know that I should do, I don't do, and the things I don't want to do, I do. What a wretched man I am. He's going through all of this psychological turmoil. But what happens in one of the last letters that he writes? I have learned to be content in all my circumstances. How did he get from the one who was murdering new believers to this mountaintop experience, to fighting with everybody in the church and everybody else who was around him, to being able to be content in all his circumstances? He passed through the crucible of the great doubt. He passed through the wilderness experience. It's not till we're emptied out that we can actually find the contentment that Paul is talking about. We can actually get free from our emotional disorders. All of that stuff that keeps us running around in obsessive and compulsive directions. And I wanted to take a little time with Elijah because Elijah, I think, is one of the most instructive to us. All the pieces are there right out front, and it makes it so easy for us to understand what this shape of the journey is really like. Now, at the point that we're going to pick up in 1 Kings, the backstory is that Ahab, who is a prince, Ahab, is the prince of, of uh, the northern kingdom of, of Judea with the capital at Samaria, is married off to Jezebel, who is the princess of the king of Tyre. So she's a Phoenician, who are descendants of Canaanites. They have their whole pantheon of gods, right? And of course, Ahab and, and the Israelites are supposed to be after the one god. But they're married, he becomes king, she becomes his queen, and immediately he is won over by her to start creating temples and high places for her gods, Baal, you know, Astarte, and so on and so forth. But she goes further than that. She starts trying to implement her religion and depose the Israelite traditional religion. She has the prophets of Yahweh killed and so on and so forth. And so God sends a drought. And the drought has been going on for about three years where we pick up the story. And Elijah, who is one of the prophets, he's the only one who has escaped. Every other prophet has been killed. He's the last one. He's been in exile. God says, it's time to go back and talk to Ahab, the king, and start to make this right and start to bring rain back to the land. And so this is where we are when he goes back. And if we take a look at 1 Kings 18, starting at verse 25, this is what's going on. At the point that we pick up this story, though, when Elijah goes to Ahab, he says, okay, I propose this. Let's find out which God is the real God. And so let's go to Mount Carmel. We're going to set up an altar there. And you bring all the prophets of Baal, and I will be alone here representing Yahweh, and we'll have two oxen, and we'll slaughter them, we'll prepare them, and we'll see who sends down the fire, Baal or Yahweh. Ahab says, that's a great idea. So Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, this is now verse 25, already on Mount Carmel, choose one ox for yourselves and prepare it first, for you are many. 
there were about, the, the, the scripture says, 450 prophets of Baal and 400 prophets of Astarte. And so Asherah, Astarte. So we've got, I don't know, at least 450 prophets on one side, maybe 850. Who knows how many showed up that day? And you got one on the other side. For you are many, and call on the name of your God, but put no fire under it. Then they took the ox which was given them, and they prepared it, and called on the name of Baal from morning until noon, saying, O Baal, answer us. But there was no voice, and no one answered. And they leaped about the altar which they made. It came about at noon that Elijah mocked them and said, Call out with a loud voice, for he is a god. Either he is occupied or gone aside, or is on a journey, or perhaps he's asleep and needs to be awakened. So they cried with a loud voice and cut themselves according to their custom with swords and lances until the blood gushed out on them. And when midday was passed, they raved until the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice, but there was no voice, no one answered, and no one paid attention. Then Elijah said to all the people, come near to me. So all the people came near to him, and he repaired the altar of the Lord, which had been torn down. Now, what happens next that I didn't include here because he only got a little bit of space here is that, of course, all he does is one prayer, and God sends down fire that not only consumes the ox, but the wood, the stones, and the earth, and everything is blown away. And, of course, the people are all blown away as well. Elijah proves that Yahweh is the true God. And then he turns around and orders all of the prophets of Baal killed. Now, whether that's 450 or 850, that's a lot of blood. And then he signals that the end of the drought is now coming. But Jezebel, the queen, is furious. And she says, as I live, you know, what you have done to my prophets, I will do to you before the next day. So she orders his execution within 24 hours. Now, you would think that Elijah would be perfectly fortified to be able to deal with one woman's wrath. What does he do? He runs. He runs like heck. He runs 100 miles south to Beersheba, which is right at the edge of the Negev. So if you're looking at, at, at Israel and the whole area, down at the bottom, the, the desert there, he's right at the edge of the desert. He's right at the edge of the wilderness. you got to see this, right? He's right at the edge of the wilderness. And then we pick up at 19 verse 4. Then Elijah, now that he's at Beersheba, he then goes out a day's journey into the wilderness. I don't know if you can picture this, but I remember when Frank and I took a, a retreat in, uh, outside of Tucson in, in this uh, retreat center that was in the middle of the saguaro forest. I, I actually had time. I had nothing to do. It was so cool. I'd get up in the morning and have breakfast, and we'd have prayer, and then I'd just pick a direction and start walking. Now, I knew maybe to walk 20 minutes, right? And then as soon as 20 minutes was done, whatever direction, I'd just turn around and come back 20 minutes. Imagine just being on the edge of nowhere and just picking a direction and walking the entire day into the wilderness. No track, no path, no nothing. You just walk. And when it starts to get dark, you pick a tree and you sit down. This is what he did. He just went out a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a juniper tree. And he requested for himself that he might die and said, It is enough now, O Lord, take my life, for I am not better than my father's. He lay down and slept under a juniper tree, and behold, there was an angel touching him. And he said to him, Arise and eat. Then he looked, and behold, there was at his head a bread cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. So he ate and drank and lay down again. The angel of the Lord came again a second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, because the journey is too great for you. So he arose and ate and drank and went in the strength of that food forty days and forty nights to Horeb, the mountain of God. So here he is a day out, didn't bring any provisions with him. He just wants to die. He was just going to sit there and let nature take its course. And miraculously, he is refortified. And then he goes another 40 days journey and ends up at Mount Horeb. You know what Mount Horeb is? Mount Horeb is Sinai. It's the same mountain. He is in the same wilderness as Moses, the same wilderness as the Israelite people at the same mountain that they were at, the mountain where Moses saw the burning bush, the mountain where he received the tablets of God, the mountain where he called water from the rock. After a 40-day journey through the wilderness, there's that number again, that time of trial and testing into a rebirth. This connection is made to Moses, 
Of course. Moses spent 40 years in the backwater of the Midian in that same area, developing what we've called here that shepherd consciousness, that life of silence and stillness that brought him to the same mountain that Elijah finds himself at, the ability to start hearing what other people miss because of the time that you spend in that emptiness, clearing yourself out, learning to value what God values in the smallest of things, finding that humility of vulnerability. This is what is being pointed to. And portraying Elijah in the same place with the fortiness as Moses is bringing those two figures together so that we can understand them as a unit. Whatever we know about Moses, now we know about Elijah as well. And isn't it interesting, those are the two that Jesus brings back on the mountain of transformation, transfiguration. There's something there that is, the writers of scripture are trying to get us to understand that there is no substitute for this time of suffering really understood as allowing. To suffer was originally to allow. The doubt, the time of uncertainty, becoming silent, emptying ourselves out. So Elijah is seen in the same way. His fortiness in the same wilderness as Moses at the same mountain. And what we see in him is growing as a spiritual man from just the spectacular and even arrogant prophet that he was at Mount Carmel, mocking everyone, killing everyone that he saw as an empty uh, enemy of God, to this silent cave dweller, right, on Mount Horeb. Someone who is now seeing life from a different perspective. And the final passage, starting at verse 9. Then he came there to a cave and lodged there. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him. And he said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? And he said, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts. For the sons of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. And I alone am left. And they seek my life to take it away. So God said, go forth and stand on the mountain before the Lord. But Elijah stays in his cave at that point. And behold, the Lord was passing by, and a great and strong wind was rending the mountain and breaking in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a sound of a gentle blowing. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood in the entrance of the cave. See, here's the point. The Elijah that was on Mount Carmel would have found the God in the earthquake, in the fire, in the wind. The Elijah who stood on Mount Carmel was looking for the spectacular. The Elijah who went through the wilderness of the great doubt and is lodged in the cave had developed the shepherd consciousness, so he's hearing God as God actually presents. And this word, these three words in Hebrew that are translated here as a sound of a gentle blowing are first the word kol, which means a voice or a sound. The second word, demama, which means silent or motionless. And the first word, dakha, which means small or thin. And so you take those three words and they literally translate as a still, small voice. That's what Elijah realized was the presence of God. What was this still, small voice? What was it really? Was it a gentle blowing on the back of his neck? Was it a whisper in his ear? The th thing that we could probably most rely on, it was just sheer silence. There was nothing that the senses could pick up but it was perceived as, it was experienced as pure presence of God himself. This is what is most likely. Sheer silence experienced as pure presence. Elijah had learned the true nature of God, not spectacular and certainly not vindictive, through the personal experience of emptying everything that wasn't God in his life. Now we fear death because death is the end of our ego selves. 
all we know, all we can actually perceive of ourselves as human beings is that ego self. Death is the end of all that. So we fear death. But that is the way of Jesus specifically, to take ourselves to that place. And he calls it not only his way, but it's the only way to the Father. If we aren't willing to move past our ego selves, there's no way that we can actually live in the Father's presence. It's only when we empty everything that we think we are that we can see who God really is. And we can start to see ourselves in God. Everything else will distract us. Everything else will obliterate that view. Lent is this time of fortiness to practice what has sometimes been called the little death of contemplation. When we really go into meditation, when we really step aside from our ego, it is like the little death. It's like practicing for our actual death when we completely step aside from our ego. But to do it for 20 minutes at a time, an hour, whatever, to see what does it feel like? What is actually there when I'm not listening to the thoughts in my head anymore, when I'm not looking through the filter of my worldview? What do I perceive? What do I experience? This is this time of Lent, what it can be, a quieting, a stilling to have this personal encounter, to experience it, and using our doubt as the engine to propel us forward. We've been reading Falling Upward. That's the book that Marianne said that she thought she butchered there, and she was trying to explain it to us. I just want to read a couple of paragraphs from this book because it's exactly what we're talking about. Here's the way Richard Rohr puts it. He says, some kind of falling, what I will soon call necessary suffering, is programmed into the journey. It's not that suffering might happen, or that it will only happen to you if you're bad, which is what religious people often think, or that it will happen to the unfortunate or to a few in other places, so that you can somehow, by cleverness or righteousness, avoid it. No, it will happen, and to you. Losing, falling, failing, sin, and the suffering that comes from those experiences, all of this is ne a necessary and even good part of the human journey. You cannot avoid sin or mistakes anyway. And if you try too fervently, it often creates worse problems. Jesus tells us there are two groups who are very good at trying to deny or avoid sin and mistakes. Those who are very rich and those who are very religious. Wow, how about that? In this book, I would like to describe how this message of falling down and moving up is, in fact, the most counterintuitive message in most of the world's religions, including, and most especially, Christianity. We grow spiritually much more by doing it wrong than doing it right. If there is such a thing as human perfection, it seems to emerge precisely from how we handle the imperfection that is everywhere especially our own. A perfect person ends up being one who can consciously forgive and include imperfection rather than one who thinks he or she is totally above and beyond imperfection. In fact, I would say that the demand for the perfect is the greatest enemy of the good. By denying their pain, avoiding the necessary falling, many have kept themselves from their own spiritual depths and therefore, therefore have been kept from their own spiritual heights. Whether it's now or whether it's 2,000 years ago, 10,000 years ago, if we're people, we're people. And this is our journey. This is the human condition. This is what we need to understand and finally accept and embrace and even celebrate that the great doubt, the uncertainty, the times of life that seem to empty us out are not evil, they're there to move us forward to where we really need to go. And like Scott Peck said, life is difficult, but the moment you accept that it's difficult, it's not difficult anymore. There is that. Lent is our opportunity to embrace the falling, to fall by intention, not just let it happen to us, not wait for the catastrophe, but experience the perfect in the imperfect moments, in the imperfect people, in ourselves, to become attentive to and appreciative of the smallest things in life. 
not just try to move ourselves from mountaintop to mountaintop, spectacular to spectacular, to realize that God is always present as that still, small voice. Not loud, not spectacular. That's always the ego talking. The wind, the earthquake, the fire. And if we are too loud, if we are too distracted, we're going to miss God. And in terms of Easter, we're going to miss the new life that Easter is meant to give us. How do we do this? Well, traditionally, the tools have been fasting, abstaining from distracting actions, engaging in silent activities, a daily commitment to mindfulness, morning quiet time, mindfulness exercises, devotional walks. These are the ways that people have done this kind of work for millennia. And I've put together five videos on contemplative concepts and contemplative practice and a couple of ebooks, and they're available to you if you want them. Come see me afterwards. They're, they're available, but I'll show you where the links are. But if you really want to do this, if you want to try to put together some kind of program, and it doesn't have to be huge, it can be something small, but something that gets you intentionally looking at how do I lower the volume? How do I lower the distractions? How do I start looking inward? Letting go and questioning the things that I think I know so well. Being willing to let them go so that something new can at least be perceived, if not engaged and held upon. This is what Easter can give to us. If we use Lent as this liturgical excuse to turn down the volume, to go into our internal wilderness, don't need to leave your jobs or your family. You do this in place, right? For this 40-day period, we can begin to thin out the things we think we know, and we can start to experience this great doubt. And let that great doubt create the experience of Easter, of something absolutely new, new life. And so the question simply is, Will we let this Lent just go by? Or will we let this Lent start to wither us down, strip us down? Will we let it help us fall just enough so that we can hear that still, small voice in the sheer silence that only we can create for ourselves? Let's pray. Father, again, all we can respond with is gratitude. Thank you for everything that you're giving us, all the tools that you've given us, the experience of countless followers that have been gathered together in church doctrine, in church liturgy and practice, in the scriptures themselves. Help us to seek just enough information that we can see the shape of the journey and then stop seeking the information and engage the journey. Help us to be willing to let go of what we think we already know so that we can experience something completely different. Use the desire that we have because of maybe the emotional disorders or whatever else has been dogging us in our lives as the impetus, the engine, to move into something brand new that is scary, but we know that if we allow ourselves to move there, something new will present in you, in your presence. Help us, Father. We're frail and we're scared, but help us to take those first few tentative steps, knowing that we're not alone, that we have each other and we have you every step of the way to empty out and see what presents. Father, thank you for being with us every step of the way. Never let us forget that we can only love because you loved us first. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's all stand.